Hey everyone, I'm super excited to begin a very good comprehensive course for beginners who want to get into cloud computing using DigitalOcean. Now, the motive of this course is going to be exploring DigitalOcean as much as we can in a great depth so that we understand ins and out of DigitalOcean platform, how you can work with it, how you can create servers, deploy applications, uh, explore the features which DigitalOcean has to offer and ha be a better developer while working with DigitalOcean in general. So I'm pretty excited in this course that we'll be covering a lot of new and interesting stuff for you. Let's get into it without wasting any time. I'll see you then in the next video. All right, guys, first things first, what the hell is DigitalOcean anyway? So DigitalOcean is an infrastructure as a service provider. Now, what do I mean by that? That means that DigitalOcean will actually provide you with hardware, with the actual cloud hardware, which you would require to run your applications, which would require you to run your databases, um, your programming interfaces, whatever you want to run on the cloud. By cloud, what I mean is that the servers are owned and maintained by DigitalOcean but DigitalOcean gives you full access to reprogram those servers, to allow people to visit those servers exposed over internet, or basically to do your private work as well if you do not want to expose it over internet, just like that. So DigitalOcean provides you the infrastructure. It does not provide you any sort of, you know, just, just a regular platform or whatever. It provides you the actual infrastructure, the raw things, and basically allows you to do anything you want, right? So similar alternatives like DigitalOcean exists, like Google Cloud Platform is one of the alternatives. AWS is another one which is very popular and we're going to get into uh, differences between um, AWS, DigitalOcean, digital Google Cloud, Heroku, stuff like that very soon in the next video most probably. So yeah, that's your DigitalOcean introduction video. So DigitalOcean provides you infrastructure as a service, allowing you to execute your application, your code on the servers owned by DigitalOcean, but leased to you for a monthly fee or for a per hour based fee, which we'll discuss later on. So yeah, the first thing is to sign up for an account on DigitalOcean. And if you use the link in the description, you're gonna get free $100 credit for DigitalOcean if you sign up using the link below in the description. That is a special link for you, which is my link from DigitalOcean, which gives you $100 of credit you can spend over the next 60 days of your registration. So get, let's get started with DigitalOcean and I'm gonna see you pretty soon in the next video. Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Mehul and in this video, we're gonna be taking a look at DigitalOcean versus AWS and other cloud hosting providers in the same space. So the idea is that uh, cloud hosting providers more or less kind of work in the same way, expose you with the same features and all that stuff, but there are quite some differences between one another, which I'm going to highlight in this video. I've used AWS and DigitalOcean both to a lot of great extent. And uh, basically I know um, the things I'll be saying are true, at least for my experience. So the first thing is that AWS and uh, I would say a lot of other cloud providers have a lot and a lot of more features than DigitalOcean alone, right? So one of the things which might bother you if you're opting in for DigitalOcean is that it does not have those many features inside of a cloud provider, right? Now, I know that uh, uh, DigitalOcean sells itself as an infrastructure as a service. And what you would expect is that, you know, just give us the infrastructure and we're going to set it all up ourselves. But a lot of times it is very, very handy when services like, you know, DigitalOcean Spaces, whose equivalent is S3 on AWS. And, uh, you know, for example, on AWS, you have simple email service, which allows you to send emails to a lot of people um, using the AWS backend. So stuff like this is kind of missing from DigitalOcean, right? If you see the services offered by AWS are huge. AWS offers a lot of services. 
Similarly, Google Cloud offers a lot of services as well. Azure offers them as well. So that's one point in favor of other, other cloud providers which are not DigitalOcean. For DigitalOcean, however, I would say the best thing is that it keeps its list of features short and the most used one. You're gonna see that you have so many features right here, but you are probably not going to use, um, I would say 98% or 95% of the features listed here, right? So you might not even ever need to use, for example, like the media services of AWS if you are not into the video business, right? If you are not into let's say uh, if you do not want to use machine learning in your application you're gonna not use this whole section right here right so there's that so AWS offers you a ton of features on the on the first hand but you might not even use most of them secondly AWS is is categorized as one of the uh, most difficult user interfaces to be to use inside of a cloud environment now I somewhat agree with the statement, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can get a hang of AWS if you start using it, if you get to, you know, just, just keep working it for a couple of weeks or more, you're gonna get, you're gonna understand how everything works in AWS dashboard. But yeah, for beginners, if you're just starting out inside the cloud journey, it might be a little bit daunting to see all those, all those gears and check boxes and, uh, you know, just fine tuning so much. DigitalOcean allows you to basically have a very clean and sleek interface for everything. And uh, yeah, in a few steps, you can just get started with complicated features like launching your own server on the cloud um, in just two or three steps. So DigitalOcean earns this point. The other thing which I like the most about DigitalOcean is its upfront pricing. So you see that although DigitalOcean is a cloud-based provider, it actually provides you the correct and clean upfront pricing cost, right? It is a nightmare to calculate pricing in AWS correctly. Now, you might redirect me to a couple of pages, you know, just look at that, look at there, and I might agree, but AWS comes with a lot of small cost here and there as well, especially with the data transfer. So AWS has all sorts of costs for all sorts of countries. For example, if your visitor is coming from India and you're using CloudFront, you're gonna be charged more. If the visitor is from US, you're gonna be charged less. Um, you know, if uh, you're hosting your S3 bucket on in some one region and uh, CloudFront is front of it, then you might be charged if, uh, just like I said, if, if the uh, country of the user is different right depending on the country um, similarly there are a lot of other hidden costs as well inside the AWS infrastructure right mostly revolving around data transfer that is what I have experienced so that is not really predictable so yeah and in fact there's cost for IO as well if you're using EC2 so you cannot have a lot of input output on your instance so there are costs like these on DigitalOcean, it's pretty straightforward, which they say to you, it's a $5 per month instance. You get a one GB RAM, one CPU, which is shared, 25 GB hard disk, and a one TB of transfer for free, right? So this package includes something, which I believe 90% of the internet who wants to host small websites would be sufficient. Maybe your personal blog, which gets, I don't know, let's say maybe two to 3000 visits a month. That, that this is like a perfect solution for you, right? And uh, yeah, even the charges for exceeding the transfer are also listed very clearly, which we'll get on in later videos. But yeah, that's that's the idea that DigitalOcean puts pricing in a very fair and clear way. And I would say that DigitalOcean in a lot of cases actually beats AWS pricing as well by a margin, a lot, a lot of margin, I would say. So AWS, everybody knows that AWS has a ridiculous model of data transfer pricing. In fact, Zoom even bailed out of AWS just because of the high, huge data transfer pricing. And they just went to Oracle for that part. 
but yeah i mean this is like one of the things which bothers me about aws is the data transfer pricing is very high so yeah DigitalOcean has a very convenient data transfer pricing you can see that you, for the five dollars per month instance you get a one tb data transfer just on the house so there's that a one tb data transfer on aws would easily cost you around seventy two hundred dollars a month so you know you are saving some money here with DigitalOcean. so yeah i mean more or less these are the few things just to summarize digital ocean has very few features compared to aws or google cloud but those few features are very very useful and 99 percent of the times so you're gonna need only those few so you can live with that in a lot of cases number two is that the pricing model of DigitalOcean is much cleaner and much cheaper in a lot of cases than its competitors right specifically aws number three i cannot think of anything else but yeah i mean that's that's that digital ocean i don't have a lot of quality problem with digital ocean not really a lot of downtime i won't say that servers are top class the network speed is good yeah i mean that's that's a top class company offering a cheap price for good instance hardware so i wouldn't i wouldn't complain about digital ocean hardware as at all because i have been running DigitalOcean myself for a couple of years now almost and yeah there have been some complaints in some areas which i'll get to as we create this content but yeah more or less my experience has been good so yeah that's that's basically it for this video and if you haven't signed up for DigitalOcean account just go ahead and sign up using the link below and once you do that we can start with our journey at DigitalOcean. so that's all for this video I'm going to see you very quickly in the next one. So what is going on everybody? My name is Mehul and welcome back to another video in which I want to explain some differences between Heroku and DigitalOcean and obviously platforms similar to Heroku as well. Now you're going to see that Heroku actually offers you a lot of things out of the box, right? It allows you to deploy your applications instantly. You know you get all these dynos your databases your continuous integration development and it also had, has paid plans and all that stuff but uh, the important thing to remember here is that heroku is an abstraction layer over the infrastructure right now heroku manages its own infrastructure that's clear but what heroku actually does is that if this is uh let's say um i don't know how do i put this if Heroku, uh, if DigitalOcean is layer one, then Heroku is layer two, right? So what happens is that Heroku is a platform as a service. So you as an end user is using a platform for which you're paying. Infrastructure comes first. Platform is built on top of infrastructure. And then your application is built on top of the platform, right? So Heroku actually provides you a platform to build your applications. So you get all those shiny and nice features out of the box with Heroku. And if you go to with paid plans, I would say you get a lot of other features as well. One thing you should remember is because Heroku provides you with so much convenience, it obviously has a, has a larger price than a similar solution running completely on DigitalOcean. Now that is obviously the case because Heroku manages the infrastructure for your for you you know heroku manages the platform for you so that has an additional cost right and it is absolutely fine for people who do not want to get into programming you know setting up own servers or load balancers databases stuff like that but you as a developer you as a person who wants to get into back end or maybe you know cloud engineering this is something I think you should not get into um, at the very first. You should understand how the actual servers are working, how the actual things work under the hood, you know, the black and white stuff, how things really work on the server, how server responds to clients, how you can manage memory, how you can create Docker instances, containers, um, you know, even load balance instances yourself have a floating IP in, IPs in place, managing DNS, all that good stuff. You should know about that. It's platforms like Heroku abstract it for the good from you, but this is like not the best approach for a person who wants to get into 
um, backend development and you know just being a cloud engineer so yeah that that for my two cents on Heroku and DigitalOcean I won't get into pricing and that much because I, I've just I have already said pricing would be much larger for Heroku than DigitalOcean because it has convenience and you do not have to do a lot of coding and setup and the products obviously Heroku outbeats DigitalOcean in that case because you know it offers so many solutions out of the box auto scaling um, you know just that is just one of the many so yeah that's that's basically it for this video i'm gonna see you pretty soon in the next one all right guys welcome back to another video my name is mehul and in this one we'll be comparing godaddy and DigitalOcean, and basically godaddy and other hosting providers like that godaddy hostgator stuff like that so um the tldr version is that if you are a developer if you know how to work with servers or if you are learning to know how to work with servers never go with services like godaddy or um you know hostgator or any other alternative because these are completely managed solutions these are um things like you they would never actually allow you to touch the actual infrastructure they would in their vps plans and all that stuff but if you're going for plans like these i would say just go for a cloud provider you know stuff like wordpress installation one click install it, it kind of feels like you are you're a person who does not really know how to just w get a wordpress zip file from their official repo and start the main installer after installing php on your server that kind of sounds like ridiculous to me that in that if you are a developer who wants to learn back in development and stuff you would opt in for this for production use for your own use right so yeah my two cents is that never opt for godaddy or hostgator or any other plans like this if you want to be a good developer who understands how the cloud tech actually works so yeah as you can see for the pricing part as well godaddy is much um i would say not really much but it is in fact costlier than DigitalOcean. you pay seven dollars a month for wordpress hosting which could be done theoretically on five dollar per month DigitalOcean um instance as well you can use DigitalOcean. uh digital ocean does not offer any cdn but you can use cloudflare cdn for example um you can have free backups yourself by setting up scripts you can you don't have really have free domain but domains are not very expensive i would say and uh, yeah they just give you one domain if you opt in for the annual plan that is if you pay for the whole year so these are like their their things right again you get unlimited professional emails with digital ocean you just have to set up the correct mx records and go to um you know sites like zoho for example which offer free email addresses personalized email addresses DigitalOcean actually guarantees you 100%, not really 100%, but yeah, as long as your server don't, doesn't go down, if you have configured it correctly, that should be fine. So yeah, I mean, there's not even a point talking about um, opting in for services like these if you want to become a developer. So let's get right into DigitalOcean now. We're going to be understanding what it is exactly, how many features it has, how you can work with it as a developer and take it from there. So that's all for this video. I'm gonna see you pretty soon in the next one. All right guys, this is just going to be a quick short video on getting you started with DigitalOcean. Just go ahead and click the link in the description below or you can see it on your screen as well. Just visit this link. You're gonna see this message in green which says free credit active. Get started on DigitalOcean with $100. If you sign up without the link, you won't get any free credit. So if you do that, you're gonna get $100 credit for 60 days and uh, yeah just go ahead and create your account with email google or github whatever you like and you should be coming back to a screen like this right so more or less that is what you'll be seeing after you sign up using DigitalOcean. so yeah that's it for this video from the next video we'll be hopping in into another section where we're gonna see how you can start working with digital oceans some of the core functionalities so that's all for this video i'm gonna see you pretty soon in the next one hi everyone welcome back and in this video let's just go ahead and take a look at what is a droplet 
because that is the first thing you see on your screen when you log in into DigitalOcean. It says you get started with the droplet. Now, the thing with internet is that when you type a site, let's say google.com, what happens is that you visit google.com, but your computer, your operating system actually has to resolve this google.com into something known as an IP address, right? And you can actually get the IP address you visited if you go to the networks tab inside your console and uh, go to the dock, click on google.com and you're gonna see that this is basically the IP address at which your computer requested the resource 172.217.167.228. Now this is one of the many IP address Google uses for its main domain google.com, right? You just happened to fetch this, fetch from this IP address because the DNS resolver told you that google.com is this IP address. Anyway, the point is that this IP address right here, which you see is associated with some computer sitting somewhere on the planet. And uh, this is the IP address of that computer, which responded you with this content, right? So you see, starting off with doc type HTML, HTML item scope, all this, all this thing, right? So this is the content. This is this whole text is what makes you see Google's homepage like this, right? So this is what makes you see Google homepage like this, which was sent by some computer sitting on the planet with this IP address. Now, the basic idea of hosting your own website is number one, get a computer yourself, get a computer, right? So you already have a computer. Number two, get a public IP address for that computer that is connected to internet somehow. Every computer connected to internet has an IP address, even your computer as well. Right now you're watching this video from a computer or a, com a phone or whatever device. But if you're connected on internet, you have a public IP address of that computer, which is communicating with this public IP address. In this case, my case is Google's IP address, but yeah. So the step number two for hosting the site on online was to get a public IP address, right? Which you can also do. Number three is getting a domain for yourself. And this is optional. You can technically go ahead and visit IP addresses as well. But you see that in our case, it just redirected me to google.com. So it can be done, right? But yeah, number three is getting domain. If you want to have easy, easy way to visit your website, like google.com or codedam.com, stuff like that. And number four is setting up this, this computer, which you owned to respond something like this when you visit, when somebody visits your site, right? Now the idea where DigitalOcean fits in is that it allows you to create a droplet. Now what this droplet is, is that it takes care of the first two things which I said. That is getting a computer, number one, and number two, connecting it to internet, right? So when you create a droplet, what DigitalOcean would do is that it would somehow magically launch a computer for you and only you on the planet Earth, right? <laughs> Not really for you and only you, it kind of uses its own virtualization, but for the most part, you can think of that. And uh, once it gets that computer for you, it will give you an IP address for that computer as well. So you now have two things. Number one, you have a computer which is running somewhere on the planet, right? Not really somewhere, you can also choose your region, but I'm just gonna stick with somewhere for now somewhere on the planet and it also has an associated IP address which can be used to reach out reach out to that particular computer over the internet. That's the basic idea of creating a droplet. So yeah, I mean that's it for this video. In the next ones we're gonna be actually seeing, this was the theory, we'll now be seeing the practicality, the actual making use of the theory to actually create a droplet and see all that good stuff in action. So that's all for this video and I'll see you then in the next one. All right, guys, now that we have an idea of what a droplet is on DigitalOcean, what we're gonna do is we're gonna review how we can create one. So I'm gonna start off with the choose an image, right? So we're gonna just stick to distributions. We're gonna explore this later on as we proceed with the course. But this basically means just choose an operating system you want to be running on that computer. So 
um, DigitalOcean just ships with Linux based computers and that too you can see right here. So there's that. In most of the cases you're gonna be just opting in for Ubuntu or CentOS because these two li are like the most popular ones. You can also choose Fedora or Debian um, or FreeBSD as for your wish. But yeah, for the most part you can just go with Ubuntu if you have no idea. Now, the second thing is that DigitalOcean asks you to actually choose a plan. Now, what do I mean by choosing a plan? Well, you see that there are basically three, or actually I should say four, categories here. You can see we have the standard category, the general purpose, CPU optimized, and memory optimized. Now, let's just get a little bit into it. I said that you have a computer running somewhere on the internet, right? Now, what happens is that DigitalOcean can allow you to have a very powerful computer, as a matter of fact, or maybe not so powerful computer. And how it can do that is because, not, not because it owns a lot of computers with a, with a kind of, uh, you know, different feature set, but it can, on its own end, use virtualization to allot you specific amount of computing power, right? So think of this in this way. DigitalOcean, for example, owns a computer which is very, very powerful. Let's say it has got a 100 terabyte of RAM or maybe like, uh, you know, one petabyte of hard disk and around uh, 5,000 cores, right? You can think of it like this way. Now, what DigitalOcean can do is that it can allow you as a developer to take maybe two cores out of it, maybe four cores out of it, and uh, 8 GB of RAM, and uh, let's say 25 GB of hard disk, stuff like that, and be done with it, right? So it can share the rest of the resources with other people. So that is, that is the main thing. So what standard is, standard basically means that whatever computer DigitalOcean provides you, the CPU of that computer is going to be shared across different instances. So what does that mean? That means that if you have a computer under the standard instance, the CPU which is being used can also be used by some other person running the standard instance as well. Well, my take on this one, it kind of performs pretty well as well on its own. In most of the cases, you won't notice any performance hit, but because DigitalOcean says that you are using shared CPUs instead of dedicated CPUs, you can you know, just expect that uh, if you don't get a 100% performance for CPU all the time, that is normal, right? General purpose means that now the CPU which you have is completely yours, right? You 100% own it and nobody can use your CPU so you won't have, you know, less CPU time for your applications running on that computer, right? So yeah general purpose is just a set of computing power options which are like the optimal combinations of uh, cpus and ram which favors um none right so it does not really favors a lot of computing power it does not really favors a lot of ram as well so you see that the first option for general purpose for us is 60 dollars per month for standard, it's $5 per month, and mostly we're gonna be looking into that only because it's a pretty decent configuration as well. But I'm just, just taking you through all the options here. So you see $60 per month, we get a 8 GB RAM, two CPUs, which are dedicated CPUs, and a 25 GB hard disk. Well, you can increase that if you want, and four TB of data transfer. Now, what does this mean, this four TB of data transfer? If you take a look in the standard, you have a one TB of data transfer for the lowest instance, and what this means is that uh, when, you, when you create your server online, when you create your website, when somebody visits your website, your server has to send them some data, right? So DigitalOcean's owned server has to communicate to your, to your clients or to a person or to a visitor's computer using the internet, the network. So that that actually incurs a cost in maintaining that whole internet infrastructure, um, you know, the routers in the place, the gateways, all that stuff. So what DigitalOcean does is that it throws you a one terabyte 
of free data transfer. That means you can transfer one terabyte of data from your droplet to any computer, not just a single computer. This is a net total um, transfer limit, right? So in net, you can transfer a one terabyte of data per month to all the all the visitors of your site and DigitalOcean would take care of that. Similarly, as your data, uh, as your instance size increases, DigitalOcean also increases the uh, data transfer limit. So you get a free transfer limit, limit for this. And mind you, this is the free limit, right? So 4 TB is a free limit. You can obviously ex uh, exceed this and DigitalOcean would charge you normally for the excessive amount of data transfer. So this is like the free bundled limit. Then we have the CPU optimized performance, which means that you have more CPUs um, to the RAM ratio, right? So we can put it in this way. If you take a look at general, general purpose ratio, you have two by eight, that is one by four. We have four by 16, that is again one by four. We have eight by 32, again one by four. We have 16 by 64, one by four again. And this is also one by four. And this is also one by four. So in general purpose, you see the ratio is one by four. For every CPU core, you have four GB of RAM. For CPU optimized, however, the ratio is one by two. For every CPU, you have two GB of RAM. Well, one way of putting that is that the RAM is reduced. Another way of putting that is that the CPU count is increased, right? So what DigitalOcean does is that some jobs are compute, uh, are, you know, just CPU extensive. They do not require a lot of memory. For example, video transcoding using FFmpeg is one of the examples which comes to my mind. It does not need a lot of RAM, but it needs a lot of computing power. It's hungry for computing power, right? So in that case, you might want to opt in for a CPU optimized performance instead of general purpose, right? For example, if you hop in for this one, this is cheaper as well as, you know, you don't even need the 8 GB of RAM, which is offered in general purpose. So there's that. Memory optimized is again, you can see the ratio is one by eight here. So memory optimized means that you have more RAM per CPU core. So that's the idea, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, if there are some applications which are RAM extensive, for example, um, mostly if you're working with a lot of data, which needs to be highly accessible by the software, so you cannot use the swap area. So you're going to want a lot of RAM to be available, right? Because RAM is a very fast memory. So yeah, in that case, you're going to be opting in for memory optimized stuff not the CPU optimized or just general purpose. So just to give you an overview again, what we discussed, standard plans means that your CPU is going to be shared across the instances, the other instances running on the DigitalOcean platform. In a lot of cases, it's a good thing. It's a good way to go, right? And it, you can see it has all those code plans reaching up to $960 per month. So, you know, they are not messing around here. It's serious stuff. And yeah, it's in, in a lot of cases, this is a good option. General purpose means that you have an optimal one by four ratio of CPU to RAM. And uh, yeah, kind of good for hosting a site or something. You can see that description, a little bit of description here too. CPU optimized, just like I said, is for more applica is for applications which are more CPU intensive and hungry for the CPU time and are optimized for multi-threaded, stuff like that. Memory optimized are the instances which are memory hungry, for example, data analysis and all that stuff. So yeah, this was a little bit of introduction on how the plants work in DigitalOcean. For the most part, for this whole series, I'm going, going to be sticking with the $5 instance because it's cheap, it's get, it gets the work done, and it's good. So yeah, that's all for this video. I'm going to see you very soon in the next one. All right, guys, welcome back. And in this one, we're going to be taking a look at the data centers. Now, there's another option called block storage, which I'm skipping for now. We're going to come to that later on because we don't really need to discuss it right away. But the interesting part after that is the data center region. So once you have selected what kind of configuration of CPU you want, DigitalOcean is actually 
uh, actually provides you the option to determine where you want to host that computer on the planet, right? So you can have that computer hosted in San Francisco, in New York, in Amsterdam, Singapore, London, Frankfurt, Toronto, and Bangalore. So these are more or less the locations where the data center owned and operated by DigitalOcean are located, right? So you see there's one um, data center of DigitalOcean in India, which is located in Bangalore. So if you go with this, you know that your computer, which uh, you're gonna get shortly, the IP address of that computer, is located somewhere in the Bangalore, in the city of Bangalore, in India, in Asia. If you, if you choose New York and you choose data center one, you have three data centers and uh, you know, uh, the second one is like restricted to some other people. I don't know, there might be some things going on, but yeah. So you have three data centers out of which you can choose the two, one and three. So these are at two separate locations, most probably. So if you choose that, you're gonna be launching a system which is somewhere in the New York. Similarly for San Francisco, Amsterdam, and so on and so forth. So eventually as DigitalOcean grows, it's going to add a lot of new data centers as well as it you know, grows its company and uh, just sets up new data centers across the world. But these are all the options you have got for now. Now, a lot of times I see that uh, people kind of get confused over what location they should choose. My personal bet is that if your site is not local, which is in a lot of times it is not, that means that it is just not restricted to a specific audience of a specific country, I would almost always recommend going for the US, that is the New York or the San Francisco. Why? Because, I don't know, I've just personally felt that the network connection when you're using New York or San Francisco instances is much, much superior. For example, in a lot of cases, I've seen that when I run apt-get update on Bangalore, um, I don't see that speed, which I see when I'm running that on San Francisco, right? Similarly, I can see that sometimes the Bangalore instance would return me as a, as a, as a visit to the site would return me with a higher first to time, first to, uh, the first byte time of the website than compared to the San Francisco instance. It's just my personal experience, but yeah, just make sure to keep those things in mind because the infrastructure which DigitalOcean might be deploying in San Francisco is not as superior as it's doing in Bangalore or Toronto, as a matter of fact. So yeah, if you do not have any choice in mind, just go with New York or San Fran. If you do have like just visitors from London or like 95% of your visitors from London, London, just go with this, right? This is going to serve them in a much better way. So for now, I'm just gonna choose New York because we don't have any preference and be done with it. So yeah, that's that's basically it for this video. Um, I'm not going to get into VPC network yet because that is going to be a whole another section which we'll discuss what is virtual private cloud. And uh, yeah, that's all for this part. I'll see you then in the next video really soon. So what is going on everybody? My name is Mehul and welcome back to another video. In this one, we'll be taking a look at how you can set up additional options and finally see how we can create our instance, that is our droplet. So we have additional options here saying uh, if you want to have an IPv6 networking, if you want to have user data, and if you want to have monitoring enabled. Now, you can, if you want, just go ahead and check, check this, but if you don't have any specific requirement for IPv6, I would just say just leave this out, right? Because it's not not something that you would very much need if you're if you're just starting out, right? So IPv6 just enables your droplet to use an IPv6 address as well with the IPv4. So yeah, you can go ahead and use that, no problem. But there's not really a benefit unless there's some use of uh, some sort of application or maybe for some performance reasons that you really want to opt in for IPv6. You're gonna get an IPv4 anyway, right? Because that is like the de facto standard still on the web. But IPv6 is catching up, yeah. User data is something which allows you to run a bunch of things before your droplet 
um, is given to you before your droplet is handed over to you, as a matter of fact. So what DigitalOcean will do is it will create the lot, create the droplet, it will boot the droplet, and it will run your user data script right here. Now, mind you, it's not a bash script. It's a YAML, the YAML file. But we are not going to get into that as well because it's just going to complicate things and it's not really required in a lot of times from the dashboard interface especially. Then we also have monitoring. A monitoring uh, agent would just enable enhanced graphs in DigitalOcean. For the most part, you want it to be checked, but I'm just going to keep it unchecked for now because I will show you how to enable monitoring for a created instance later on. So yeah, let's just begin right there. So I'm just going to keep all these three unchecked and I do not want the VPC as well. So let's just proceed, proceed forward. The next thing is um, authentication. Now you want to get into your computer that DigitalOcean droplet which you created in one way or another, right? Because you want to control it, you want to program it in order to send uh, relevant responses to maybe clients or maybe if you want to do some work on the cloud, whatever your reason is, you want to actually get into the instance. So what you have to do for that case is that you can have two options. You can either create a password that would be then a username password combination to log in into your instance or you can set up an SSH key. I would almost always recommend going for an SSH key because uh, it might seem like a hassle at the first and password might seem very convenient, you just have to write it. But SSH keys are very, very secure. And compared to passwords, it will take a lot of time to actually brute force an SSH key compared to a weak password. So yeah, you're gonna see here that you have no key for yourself, so you want to create a new SSH key and it'll just prompt you with a box like this. So what you have to do is now go back to a terminal. Now if you're running Mac or Linux, you should be fine. If you're running Windows, you can download something known as um, a Git Bash. Yeah. So there's a software called Git Bash, which comes with the uh, open SSH, I believe, that, that toolkit, which allows you to get access to the commands we'll be typing now. So once you are into that, just go into any folder Preferably, you want to go into the .ssh folder, but I'm just going to keep it inside my custom folder that is called DigitalOcean Course because I don't want to mess up my SSH folder, but ideally you want to go into this SSH folder right here, right? So, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and write a command called SSH Keygen. What this is going to do is going to generate two files for me. The first file would be a public key and the second file would be a private key public key would be used by you to authenticate that yes you uh, the public key sorry I got it around would be used by the server it will be stored on the server the private key would be used by you to actually say to server that hey I'm authorized to log in so private key is pretty much like your password in a in a way right so yeah so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let's say I name this as DigitalOcean key and I do not want any passphrase and there we have it. So you see that we have two keys, DO key and DO key dot pub. I can just show you both of these. So this is the private key and this is the public key. So what you want is you want to copy this public key right here and uh, go ahead and paste it inside the SSH key content right so digital ocean what it will do is when it's creating your the it's creating your computer that instance that droplet it will copy this public key over to that particular computer which would then recognize your private key right here and will authenticate you to use that particular computer right so once you do that you can just name it like digital ocean Tutorials. I'm just gonna make it like that. You can name it like your main server or whatever you want and just add an SSH key So once you do that, you can just check on this and make that DigitalOcean would just transfer your key automatically No problems there Then finally you want to you know if you want to create multiple droplets of the same configuration You're gonna do that but in a lot of cases you just want to create one especially when you're creating with the control panel 
and a host name is basically um, something which would be um, visible to you inside your control panel right so I'm gonna give this as a digital digital ocean tutorial right tag allows you to you know just tag a bunch of droplets which belong to a same purpose and uh, allows you to easily manage them across firewall rules or maybe if you want to delete them all together stuff like that right so i'm gonna just leave tags for now but you can give it a tag for example custom tag for example like that and if you create a bunch of other droplets with custom tag as well later on you can basically control them in some way all together using just customizing using just rules on this particular tag so i'm just gonna leave it but you can fill it here with anything you like then the project in my case i have two for you you would see only one my second project is code dam which is the actual infrastructure um where the code dam.com site is hosted so yeah i'm using DigitalOcean at the moment for code dam so you can use your own name or you can create a new project if you want projects are free so you do not have to pay for creating a project but yeah it just helps you to customize and basically sort work related stuff with your personal related stuff and i would almost always not recommend this enable backups although it is recommended because it's very costly it's 20 percent of the droplet price and for the most part you do not ever want to have a complete backup of the instance you mostly want the backup of database right because your code is something which is with you as well it probably is, a, is on a version control system like github as well so you should be fine there in case your droplet crashes or something happens but you want your database to be backed up and ain't nobody gonna pay a dollar a month that is 20 percent of the droplet price for just backing up your database you can just set up a very simple script which uploads your um, database on on for example let's say google drive every day and uh, be done with it right so yeah there's that so once you do that you can go ahead and everything just check it once and everything looks good we are running ubuntu on a five dollar machine um on a new york data center we have our ssh key configured we just want one droplet no tags and that's the project let's go ahead and create this droplet so once you do that you're gonna see it starts creating your droplet for you and you already have the access to the ipv4 address that is the ip address of the droplet you can see your configuration for the droplet you have one virtual cpu which is shared 1 gb of ram 25 gb ssd and it costs you five dollar a month and it just booted up real quick as well so there's your instance now we're going to be using this ip address somehow to ssh into this machine and then control it from that point if you see right now if you go ahead and take a look at this ip address you're going to see that nothing happens because obviously the server is not configured but now on the internet you own this ip address right you own this ip address and you control it everybody who goes to this ip address if you configure the server correctly can see the content you want to share with the world so that's how you set up a computer get it an ip address we have done the first two steps let's move on and see how we can ssh into the computer um, in the next video so that's all for this one i will see you then very soon in the next video hey everyone welcome back and in this video let's just go ahead and take a look how we can ssh into this droplet to actually control it so what we want to do here is just take a look at our ip address that is the ipv4 mostly and go back to our terminal now here's the folder where i created two files the digital ocean key and digital ocean key dot public you can get rid of the public file safely because it's stored on your remote server now what you need to do is in order to ssh you have to write ssh you have to give the credential file that is your private file using the dash i flag and what this would be is our do key just like that then you need to pass in the credential for authentication right with which username do you want to be authenticated well DigitalOcean creates a default account for you using the root username and you can use that you can only use that as a matter of fact you cannot use any any other username but yeah 
root would work fine and then you want your IP address right here right and <clears throat> hit enter so once you do that you're gonna see it ask you for a message like this and uh, yeah I mean if you're not very paranoid it's just always go ahead and okay to trust the source because the, you're gonna see this message only the first time because of how the SSH protocol works and the authentication works of the SSH key. I don't exactly have an idea how, how this authenticity actually works, but more or less you never do really need to care about this after the first um, authentication, assuming that you are not in a in a network which is very, very, you know, you have the you have the expectation that you are being monitored or something like that in those cases you're just gonna say yes so anyway once you do that you're gonna see that you get into your DigitalOcean tutorial instance just like I am under the root account and if you take a look at the memory you're gonna see that you have a total of 985 megabytes which is 1 GB but uh, you know uh, the DigitalOcean instance might be reserving some of that memory for for some some other purposes I don't exactly know but more or less you have roughly about 700 megabytes of memory on this instance for you waiting to work and exploit and you can see for the disk space as well you have 25 g uh, gigabytes of SSD which is which was just promised which comes with a about a 1 GB of operating system and other files already installed so yeah there's that so yeah, that's how you're gonna boot into your DigitalOcean machine. That's how you're gonna SSH into that and take control. So as a matter of fact, what we can do is just go ahead and install Nginx real quick so that I can just show you that how easy it is to just have a hello world. So once we install Nginx, you're gonna see that Nginx, actually let's just go with apt-get update first and then apt-get install. Nginx. So once you do that, you're going to see that Nginx automatically enables itself and listens on your port 80 of your IP address and is ready to respond to people who are coming to your website, right? It's a very lightweight server, very powerful. Um, a lot of companies use it, so you're in good hands. So once it's installed, you're going to see you get a message like this and you can check the status of nginx and you can see that it is loaded and it is active right so now if you go ahead on the same ip address and take a look you're gonna see that you get a message like this welcome to nginx right which is being delivered by this computer which you own which sits somewhere in new york and uh, yeah so you can just share this ip address to anyone and they're gonna see the same message all along the world how cool is that so yeah that's basically it how you're gonna ssh into a DigitalOcean droplet because this is not a programming tutorial i'm not really gonna get into how you set up a server and all that stuff but yeah you get the idea so that's all for this video and i'm gonna see you then in the next one all right guys welcome back and in this video we're gonna be seeing how we can enable DigitalOcean metrics on your droplet so if you click on your droplet you're gonna see that in the graphs section you see um you know you see three graphs it's okay it's fine but we can do better than that right you have very less details at the moment so we can get a lot more details when you opt in for the new metrics for your digital ocean now for this what you need to do is if you're creating the droplet that is if you're creating it from this menu right here you're gonna see that we did not check that <clears throat> one box which said that do you want monitoring or not so if you're creating the droplet and you want monitoring baked in, you can check this and be done with it, right? But we did not do it for our DigitalOcean tutorial droplet. So <clears throat> we have to do something like this in our case, right? So what we want to do in this case is using this link, you see that what you have to do is just install, just run this script, this little script right here. You can just go ahead and watch the script first as well if you want but uh, um, you know you can just go ahead and do that but before that it just says that you want to uninstall the legacy metrics agent as well so let's just go ahead and run that first of all once you do that you're going to see that if you do not find it 
if you do not find the package DigitalOcean agent, that's fine. Let's just go ahead and run this instead. And we're gonna see that it will set up, it will download the script, it will configure the packages and it will run it for you automatically. So once that happens, what's going to happen is that if you go back and take a look in your graphs, just refresh this, you're gonna see that now you would have a lot of graphs, right? So previously you just had CPU and um, I guess the um, the bandwidth graphs. You're gonna get bandwidth graphs again, but it'll just take a, a bunch of minutes to just boot up, right? Correctly, so that the data populates. Meanwhile, it's populating. What we can do is we can go ahead and install apt get install stress. So it's just a it's just a package which would allow you to burn your CPU cores a little, so that we can actually see whether that's reported correctly in the DigitalOcean console or not. So I'm going to say stress my CPU for with one worker and just give it a timeout of 30 seconds, right? So there's that. And in fact, we can just, you know, just go into the droplet. Actually, let me just go ahead and do that first. I'm going to install htop as well, a very nice tool for, um, you know, stats. So now let's just go ahead and stress our CPU. And inside htop, you're going to see that we are actually, in fact, burning our CPU core at 100% while this is running, the stress script is running, right? So that should be reflected in our graph as soon as we have some data for the DigitalOcean graph to show. And it will just take a little bit of time and you can see now we, st we have started getting data for our graph. So let me just go ahead and run it for 30 more seconds and we should be able to see a high CPU usage um, in the DigitalOcean console as well. And you can clearly see that after waiting for some minutes, you're going to see that CPU usage spikes to almost 100 here and you get other usages as well. So it's working just fine. Now, one of the cool things about this is you can actually create an alert policy as well. So you see that if CPU is, you know, your CPU is running about 70% or maybe 80% for more than five minutes, that is a sign that something is happening on the server and something should not be consuming that much CPU, right? So you can just get yourself an alert via an email or you can connect your Slack and you can just specify the droplet here. You can just name it DigitalOcean, you know, whatever your name was droplet was and you can create that policy. And again, this is free of cost. So you do not have to pay anything for the alert policy to DigitalOcean, which is pretty good. So yeah, that's how basically you're going to enable monitoring for DigitalOcean and that's how it will work. And that's all for this video. I'll see you then in the next one real quick. All right, guys, now that we have created our first droplet, it's time to secure it. Now, what do I mean by securing it is that, uh, you know, just assigning some firewall rules to this droplet so that people are not able to access your instance, your computer hosted on Internet in a way which you do not intend them to. So what you want to do is you want to head over to networking right here and you want to go into firewalls. So what you want to do is you're going to create a new firewall right here and name it whatever you like. I'm going to name it as DigitalOcean First Firewall, something like this. And what you want is you want to customize the rules right here. So these rules right here would define how the traffic reaches to your DigitalOcean instance. And what we want to do is what happens is when a person types this IP address that is, you know, specific to your droplet, what happens is first of all, the request reaches to the main DigitalOcean servers, then the DigitalOcean servers decide that which server, which computer should be responsible for handling that request right so by using firewalls inside your digital ocean panel itself what you can do is you can restrict the access on something known as the network layer that is the layer 4 so and this happens before even the request reaches your own server 
So it's basically like DigitalOcean is sitting in front of you and protecting you and the request does not even reach your own computer if you sort of block it using the DigitalOcean firewall here. This is one of the primary difference between creating a firewall here and creating a firewall on your computer itself that is like you know just using IP tables or um, I don't know some other tools like that. So in that case the actual packets the actual information reaches your computer your computer uses some sort of CPU time or maybe you know uses some sort of mechanism some software to parse whether that request should be accepted or dropped and then if it is accepted it goes through if dropped you just respond blank right if you use a firewall like this on DigitalOcean's resources DigitalOcean is now responsible for blocking or allowing the traffic right not your own computer so you kind of get that advantage plus you can pretty much customize it very quickly from the dashboard as well and for the most part you do not really need to customize this very often you just have to customize this once or twice and once the configuration is fine you should never really touch about your firewalls at all unless you think there's a breach or you know you need to extend some functionality so yeah that's that's basically it so yeah, that's it for the introduction part for the firewall. In the next one, we're going to be learning about these protocols right here, some of the most common ones at least, and see how we can implement some firewalls rules. So that's all for this video. I'm going to see you in the next one. All right, everybody, welcome back. And in this video, we'll be learning about TCP, UDP, and the ICMP protocols, right? Most of the internet consists of TCP and UDP protocols. What is a protocol? Well, this is not a networking class, but I'll just keep it brief. So I won't give in, get into details of how protocols work and all that. But protocols is just a way two computers agree to communicate, right? So we, we, we two people, that is me and you, are agreeing to communicate using the language English. So I say some word, right? Then I pause. Then I write a full stop and you understand that the sentence has been, you know, terminated or maybe I should give a pause in my thought here. You know, you construct that in your brain. Similarly, how computers communicate is using protocols. So if you use a TCP protocol and the other party is also using a TCP protocol, you both have certain expectations in terms of how the communication should be started, how the communication should be carried on and how the communication should end, right? So there's a certain certain things which both party already know like you and I both know English similarly every every computer which is connected on internet um, should know TCP and UDP by default so TCP protocol is used for a lot of other protocols as a base protocol so you're gonna see SSH is built on top of TCP HTTP is TCP HTTPS is TCP MySQL is TCP DNS TCP, DNS UDP, well, they have the protocols in name, and ICMP as well. So, that's about TCP. What is UDP? UDP is basically another, another protocol, just like TCP, but it is much relaxed. So, TCP um, kind of uh, takes a job that it should deliver what has been sent. So, it, it is kind of responsible protocol. UDP, on the other hand, is that guy from the ages of 16 or 17 who's irresponsible and does not really care about the world a lot and would kind of attempt to do the work but if it fails he'll not look over twice but TCP is that responsible citizen age 35 or 40 who is determined to complete the task given to him so yeah you can think about that but anyway the idea is that uh, your websites work on TCP and UDP uh, just that's the TCP protocol not the UDP sorry so the idea is that you only want to allow TCP traffic on your websites and by default what you want is you only want the HTTP protocol the HTTP traffic to be allowed or maybe you want HTTPS as well right so once you have these two rules in place every other thing every other traffic would be dropped what is the difference between HTTP and choosing, um, you know, custom and TCP here? Well, the difference is you can specify the port here as 80. And this is actually equivalent to just writing HTTP here, 
right? So you can see that it's one and the same thing. And for HTTPS as well, it's one and the same thing. So once you have that in place, every other traffic is going to be dropped, right? And this is inbound rules. So that means that I, as an end user, when I try to request this instance, my instance, I am a user and the request is an inbound request to this particular computer, which is running on this IP address. So that is the rule for inbound request. Now, your own server can make requests to internet as well, right? That's fair enough. You know, you can go to your server right here and you can go ahead and say something like call google.com, right? So right here, you just made a external request to Google. So you can go ahead and even customize that. So if you want your instance to never communicate with the outside world, well, that's one way to drop all the traffic. But in almost every case, you do not want that because, you know, in that case, you'll also lose the ability to actually have a website online, right? Because you won't be able to update packages. You won't be able to reply to people who are using your website, using a custom port, and you won't be able to even, um, you know, just install new packages, stuff like that. So for the outbound rules, you probably in a lot of cases just want to leave it like this. For the TCP part, um, you want the SSH to be all IPv4, all IPv6. You can do that, or maybe you can just go ahead and add just your own URL. So for example, if you're running 1.1.1.1, for example, just an example. Now, only the person with the IP address of 1.1.1.1 would be able to SSH into your instance, nobody else, right? So for example, if we go ahead and apply this to digital ocean tutorial, and if I create this firewall, what you're gonna see now is that if I go back and if I exit because, um, yeah, I think the connection is already dead. So if I go ahead and try to SSH now, what we're gonna see as, in fact, let's just make it a little bit verbose, but you're gonna see that we are stuck now on connecting because the traffic for the SSH is actually dropped by DigitalOcean before it can reach our server, we can never get a response from our own server. That means we are just stuck at the connecting phase. So let's just go ahead and make this all IPv4 and all IPv6 and save it. And you're gonna see now we would be able to connect just fine because the firewall has been updated. So there's that. Again, you can play around with this by going here, editing rule, uh, removing these um, and saving. Now what you should be able to see is that if you refresh now, you cannot visit the Nginx page. You see that the cursor keeps loading, it's waiting for the server to respond, but it never would and it'll just time out. So there's that. Now once you go ahead and edit the rule and add all IPv4 and all IPv6, you're gonna see that it's going to work again just fine, right? So there's that. So that's how firewall inbound and outbound rule works in DigitalOcean and it's pretty handy to keep at least these three ports open to everyone. I would say for SSH, you can whitelist your only IP, do not blacklist everything. Um, but yeah, that's more or less. For the all the other ports, the traffic would automatically be blocked, the traffic would be blacklisted. So you do not have to worry about anything except you right here. So that's all for this video. I'm gonna see you really soon in the next one. So what is going on everybody? Welcome back and in this section we'll be taking a look at Virtual Private Cloud or VPC in DigitalOcean. Now this is a fairly new thing. So um, not a lot of material is out there on Virtual Private Cloud but this is uh, this is fairly new for DigitalOcean, just to put the facts out there. It has been around for a lot of time in other cloud providers like AWS or Google Cloud, but DigitalOcean just shipped with VPC um, as an official thing. So what basically, what you can think of VPC is that we have seen that you work with droplets, you create a lot of droplets, you can create a lot of droplets and you know, you can destroy them as well. Just just work with them right away, right? 
The thing is though that a lot of times you want your droplets to be communicating between themselves as well. So you have maybe you have four or five droplets right here right listed as main instance or database or whatever it is right and then you want that communication to take place that your main instance should be able to communicate some sort of information with the database instance the database instance is able to communicate some sort of information with the proxy instance you know some way or another you want a bunch of droplets to communicate so that that sort of thing actually happens when you have a network when you have a private network sure you can do that on a public network as well you can if you have a bunch of droplets listed here you can get its public ip address and call an endpoint but that is um, very inefficient to begin with because you would be routing traffic all over the internet just to reach out to a computer which is sitting next to you right so that that's simply irrelevant and you would result in a lot of bandwidth waste as well plus the speeds would be slow so what um, we come up with and in a lot of cases it's also insecure so what what we come up with is that we would let a lot of you can create a lot of computers but with public IP what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a private IP as well we're gonna give that particular droplet a private IP as well so once you create a droplet you're gonna see right here you see that it actually asks you for a VPC network right so you see that once you have selected no VPC we get that this droplet will have no private IP now private IP is the IP which would allow you and your other droplets to communicate among themselves within that particular server area within that particular data center right if you do not have a private IP you can communicate technically over the public IP just like I said but it's inefficient so we need to have a private IP for that we need to create a VPC network a virtual private cloud it is basically a network which is assigned to you which you can then make use of in your droplets in your services whatever and you would have your own little data center kind of thing right so you will have a network of computers you would have your own private cloud your you know a cloud where you can have a lot of droplets a lot of computers running and they have a private ip address space which you can use extensively to communicate that is the main idea right so that that's basically what virtual private cloud is all about the rest is terminology and definitions and all that good stuff but the basic idea is that you get a bunch of droplets right so this is how a vpc network configuration would look like so you get a bunch of droplets and uh, you just you just enclose them in a predefined address space a private address space which is covered by a virtual private cloud and uh, they are then able to use those ip addresses communicate with each other so there are some advanced use cases like you know just having an internet gateway as a droplet and making use of vpc for that but those come with the, with with the time so yeah that's that's basically it for the introduction part that's all for this video i'll see you then in the next one hey everyone welcome back and in this video let's just go ahead and take a look at how you can set up your very first vpc on DigitalOcean. so for that what you have to do is go to the networking tabs here and click on vpc on the top as a tab once you do that you might see a vpc if you have created a droplet before or you might not if you haven't created it yet but nonetheless what you have to do to create a new vpc is just click this button and you're going to see that you come to a page like this now what you have to do first of all is select a region in which you want your vpc your virtual private cloud to be present now by region what i mean is that your vpc your private cloud is going to be a bunch of droplets a bunch of instances which are very likely sitting next to one another right so they have to be together physically as well because uh, if they are not physically together you have to use internet to reach out to the other droplets which defeats the purpose of what vpc provides you know communication over private ip and speed and you know you do not have to traverse the whole internet to reach to the other instance and so on 
so your VPC should be confined to only a single place. Now you can have VPCs in all these places individually, but you cannot have a droplet in New York and a droplet in Toronto and that be a part of a virtual private cloud. That's not going to happen. So yeah, let's just go ahead and choose San Francisco 2. Um, once you do that, the next thing is to configure the private IP range. Now, just like I discussed, um, your droplets, your servers actually communicate using private IP. So there are two types of IP addresses, the public IP address and the private IP address. Private IP address is nothing but a reserved set of IPs which cannot be public IP addresses, right? So that means that those IP addresses, those set of IP addre addresses are not allowed to be used as public IP addresses to reach to other services or other websites on the internet. So private IP addresses, why they are reserved? Well, they are reserved for exactly this purpose where you want the communication to happen, but you do not want the communication to happen on the internet. Instead, you want it to happen on the intranet, right? Within the computers sitting next to each other in some way or another. So for that part, what you need to do is you need to assign each of that particular computer which is sitting next to you an IP address, right? And for that, DigitalOcean needs to reserve a certain set of range of IP addresses for you. So either you can let DigitalOcean determine the IP address range for, your, for you, which is the best because they, they'll take care of the things like, um, you know, you do not have any overlapping in the VPCs in a specific region so that your IP addresses don't overlap. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll be managing the IP address range so that you do not have to mess with the subnets and, uh, you know, all that stuff which goes in with the network addresses you must know like the classes of the IP addresses, how much size you want and all that stuff. So you, if you don't want to mess around with that, this is the best option. So we're going to eventually select this, but I'm just going to explain the configure my own IP range as well. Now, this is not a networking tutorial, so I won't be going deep into how IP addresses work and you know what the subnet is, how the IP ranges work, but I'll just give you a brief overview idea. You're going to see that DigitalOcean out of the box allows you with three options. You can go with 251 available addresses, 4091 and 65531. So what does that mean? That basically means that if you go ahead and pick this and you enter a relevant IP address range, what it means is that you can have a maximum of 251 droplets in that virtual private cloud. Um, anything larger than that, DigitalOcean would not be able to assign it an IP address, a private IP address. Why? Because you have exhausted the number of IPs, right? So you can go ahead and take a look at 4091 as well. So 4091 actually means that you have these many maximum droplets available in this virtual private cloud. So you cannot create more than 4091 droplets. Similarly, if you choose the 16, you're going to have 65,000, which is a huge limit, right? And uh, it might be suitable as well for you for almost every case. So the thing is, how does the 16, 2024 20, play um, the role? If you go ahead and try a custom, for example, if I write, um, let's say 18 here. So what happens? What happens is that now I basically have 18 bits to mingle. An IP address, an IPv4 address at least, is a 32-bit IP address, right? So, 32-bit number, so as to say. So, what the 16, 17, 18, and, you know, all this 24 and all that stuff means is the number of bits which are fixed, right? So, when you choose 24, there are 24 bits which are going to be something which is going to identify your network and the rest of the bits would be identifying your computer right if you choose 20 bits that means 20 bits now would be identifying your network and the rest of the bits would be identifying computer in that network so you see that as you decrease these this number the bits available for identifying your computer increases right so you see that when you choose 16 now you can identify 65,000 computers 
right? Because there are 16 more bits now. And if you do a little bit of math, you're going to see 2 raised to the power 16 is pretty close to 65,000 only. Now, there are a bunch of IP addresses which DigitalOcean might have, have in reserve or whatever. But yeah, that's the general idea. So you can use this nice little converter if you want. So I can have something like, you know, uh, let's say 10.0.0.0. And if I have 16, I'm going to go ahead and calculate it. You're going to see that I can actually have 65,536. DigitalOcean shows me 65,531, which is like five IP short. But yeah, we can work with that. So yeah this is the this is the most idea for the most part and the private ip range you can see DigitalOcean supports all the three classes class a class b class c ip addresses class a being the ip addresses with the most ips with them class b is 172 class c is 192 168 168 right so yeah for the most part um this is what you want generate an ip range for me so that's what we're gonna do for the name, I'm going to go ahead and choose VPC first, first VPC, something like that. Oops, right. And you can enter a description, my first VPC or whatever you think would be a suitable description. And once you go ahead and create that, you're going to see your first VPC is created right here, right? and uh, you're going to see some resources attached to it i have one in san francisco that is uh, being used by codedam so this is the private uh, virtual private cloud for codedam this is the default one and the default one is basically um what was the previous known feature as private networking in DigitalOcean, right so just like i said vpc is a new thing in DigitalOcean. it was not available before um, so they just converted all the existing networks, existing existing private networks to the default VPC. So first VPC is here. You're going to see that it just shows you nice and easy things. But the main advantage of VPC comes when you actually add resources, right? When you actually add, add droplets, when you actually add databases, stuff like that to a virtual private cloud, then you can actually harness the power of virtual private clouds even even in in cases of like configuring a gateway or something but for the most part you if you're a small startup or whatever you don't really want to get into a lot of security um at the first thing right as the first thing because you would have a, a lot of other things as well to address so yeah for the most part that's it for resources we're going to see um how we can communicate between droplets in the next video so that's all for this video. I'm going to see you in the next one really soon. Hey everyone, welcome. And in this video, we're going to be seeing how you can communicate um, within the virtual private cloud on your droplets. And I just want to show you this as the video where you can see that you can actually communicate with the, with the droplets themselves if they are a part of virtual cloud and they cannot communicate if they are not the part. So let's just go ahead um, in our default projects and right here what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by creating three droplets so let's just start and uh, let's see how we can make our way forward with that so I'm going to choose Ubuntu and a five dollar instance I'm going to go with San Francisco because that is where our first VPC is so I'm going to create that right and you can see that it verifies that addresses are available or not by default, you're going to see this is the range which DigitalOcean gave me. That is 10, 20, 10, 1, 20, 0, 0, uh, with a subnet of 20, which means that I have right now 4,090 addresses available. So once we have that in place, DigitalOcean would automatically assign them an IP address. So we, we should not be worrying about that. Then for the next thing, SSH keys, we have already set this up. I'm going to choose DigitalOcean tutorial. And finally, I want three droplets here, right? I'm going to say VPC1, VPC2, VPC3. It's smart enough to do that. And then no tags for now. And select project as Mehul Mohan, right? So this looks good, right? Let's just go ahead and spin this up. So once I go ahead and click on create droplet, you're going to see we have three droplets upcoming. And uh, if I just go ahead and refresh maybe or just wait 
let me just go ahead and refresh because DigitalOcean actually gives the IP address right away. But sometimes it does not. So yeah. Yep. So you can see all of these are having the VPC as the first VPC, right? And they have the private addresses addresses as the following. So that you can actually see. This has 10.1.20.02, 10.1.20.02, sorry, 10.1.20.03 and this should be 10 1204 right so yeah i mean we have that let's just go ahead and ssh into all three all right so now you can see that i have three terminals with me that is the vpc1 vpc2 vpc3 ssh sessions and let's just go ahead and install um nginx on all of them so that we have something available on port 80. so i'm going to say app install nginx on the first one and i'm going to say app install oops i think we need to do app update and apt install y nginx on all these right and i'm just going to go ahead and copy this as well here and as well here so what it's going to do is it's just going to set up nginx and start it as well so that we when we hit on port 80 of all of these we have something um coming back as the response right so if i go ahead and call localhost localhost port 80 you're gonna see that we get a nice little nginx response similarly from all the other servers as well because well that's what nginx does right so anyway once we have that let's just go ahead and figure out their private ip addresses you we can see it from the dashboard but we can also see it with if config you can grab the 10 range and you're going to see this vpc1 is 10 which matches the private ip listed here so yeah dashboard is correct if you were wondering so anyway um for this we have 03 and for the last one we have 04 so what happens now if i go ahead and say 10 120 for example and put hit port 80 we see that we still get the nice little nginx response and for the 04 as well we get it right similarly for this if i go ahead and write call 10 which is the vpc1 port 80 you see that we are able to communicate similarly for this as well so call 10 port 80 yep and for 03 as well awesome so what I'm going to do next is actually show you that a droplet out of out of this VPC would not be able to communicate. So yeah, I think we did not need a third droplet really because there's no easy way to remove a droplet, pull it out from VPC unless you take a snapshot and create a droplet again, which will come, uh, come to later on. So let's just go ahead and create another droplet. And I'm going to make sure that we choose everything just like before, except it won't be in the VPC. So we were in San Francisco, I guess. And let's just go ahead and take a look as well. So yep, we are in the first VPC, but I'm not going to have this in a first VPC. I'm gonna choose default SFO2 so that we at least get an IP address because if I go with no VPC, it won't have a private IP address at all. So you won't be able to like, you know, actually communicate with internal things at all. So I'm gonna go with default and I'm gonna add DigitalOcean here and that would be uh, out out VPC something like that you know and let's just go ahead and create this so once you do that and once you wait for the out VPC to boot let me just go ahead and copy this meanwhile and I'm gonna go ahead and right here I'm gonna SSH into this bad boy and let's just wait for the droplet to boot first right because you can't really boot, you can't really SSH into a droplet which is actually being in the process of being created. So yep, there it is. And if I go ahead and SSH into it now, we should be able to see our good message of authentication. Let's just give it a couple of more seconds. Your droplet might, you know, just show you some tantrums, but it will work eventually so here we are now this droplet is not in the vpc land with us 
but it does have a private address, right? So, oops, not this one, this one. You can see it has 10, 138, 66, 230. So let's just go ahead and try to just confirm that. IF config, crept in, and yep, that is exactly what we saw. So let's just go ahead and install apt install nginx and we need apt update as well before that and there we go so meanwhile what i'm going to do is i'm going to try to curl 10.138.66.230 at the port 80 right so let's just let's just make sure it's installed and let's just wait for it to hit 100 real quick and there we are so now if i go ahead and call a local host at port 80 we should be good if i call it you're gonna see that we are not able to reach to this particular droplet right if i try to call it from here nope if i try to call it from here nope nobody out of these three is able to reach it sure you can try localhost here you can see it's working and you see that the private address of this droplet is also this but you can't directly communicate this without exposing it to internet and good for us this actually has an internet address as well so i can go ahead and curl the public ip and hit the port 80 and it will work just fine but you see the response is a bit slow the response would be a bit slow you know you're traversing the whole internet to just to reach a machine which is right next to you because it's not in the vpc and yeah that's how it's pretty much going to work similarly you cannot really reach 10.120.02 from here as well so if you try to do that you cannot reach however you can reach it from its ip address that is its ipv4 so that's not a problem right so this is how in a nutshell vpc works so you can have a bunch of private resources communicating with just each other um just like probably if you own a data center or something that's how you're going to configure it and uh, yeah that's how you that's how you're going to do it right so that's all for this video i'm going to see you in the next one so what is going on everybody my name is mehul and welcome back and in this section we'll be starting off with snapshots in DigitalOcean. now snapshots is one of my favorite features because i'll use it a lot on my own sites like code dam and it's pretty much a good thing to have in a cloud provider why what it is i'm going to discuss all that in detail in this section let's get started so what is a digital ocean snapshot anyway well you see by the name of it you can say that make on demand copies of droplets that's what digital ocean says so what this is in a nutshell is you take a droplet for example a running droplet like this you can or cannot power it off to preserve the data then what you do is you run some magic and what you create is a single file which is an exact copy an exact state of your droplet right so it's basically like doing some black magic or something which is going to create a exact copy of your server not your hard disk not you know not just anything but your actual server right so all the installed program remains all the hidden files remains, all the configurations you did on the server remains, everything, ditto, exact, bit by bit, right? Everything remains in even your operating system or whatever. What you do next is that once you have that file, well, DigitalOcean technically does not give you that file, but it just lets you interact with it um, through an API or, you know, through the interface itself. You can go ahead and replicate this instance, right? So for example, let's say you did a lot of work on this particular instance and now it's done, right? It's completed, your work is completed, but it took you a lot of time to set this instance up, right? And you might need that instance 15 days from now, right? And you might need it every seven days, for example. So are you willing to go ahead and delete the droplet every time? And you know, after seven days come on the side, create that droplet, set it up again, which probably takes an hour or something. And just after doing it, doing your work for four or five hours, delete it again. Then after seven days, repeat it. You know, it's tedious to do that. So what's the best approach in this case is you set it up once, 
you go ahead and create a snapshot of that particular disk image. It's going to cost you some something, but it's, it's basically very cheap. And what you do is that you go ahead and use that image, you use that snapshot to create another droplet whenever you want, right? So you can see right here, I have my own Docker shot named droplet here, which has a size of 4.75 GB and it's in San Francisco region, right? So yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting to see how you can utilize snapshots and it actually cost you five cents per GB per month. So for 4.75, you can estimate it's, um, you know, about 25, 23 cents a month for me, right? Which is not a lot if you um, compare it with running your droplet for the whole month, right? So running a complete droplet would cost you $5 per month, but this is going to cost you 5 cents per month per GB. Right? And for the most parts, your droplet is going to be around 1 GB or 2 GB as, as, as a thing, right? So yeah, you can also use Snapshot as one of the backups thing, right? So DigitalOcean technically offers a backups by themselves, but uh, it's, it's, it's actually expensive, honestly. You see that it actually costs 20% of your actual backup. So yeah, you meant... I mean, if you are able to hack around a script or, you know, some sort of thing which takes a snapshot every week and delete the previous week's snapshot, it's it's much cheaper to opt in for um, something like this, right? So, yeah, that, that's the main idea. So, yeah, that, that was an introduction to snapshots. In the further videos, we're going to see how to create snapshot ourselves, how to restore images from them and do a lot of fun things. So that's all for this video. I'm going to see you in the next one. What's going on everybody? My name is Mehul and welcome back. And in this video, we're going to be creating our very first snapshot. You see, I have a DigitalOcean droplet running out VPC and this is the shell for the out VPC thing, right? So this is the active shell. Now, what I want to do is I want to install, you know, we have Nginx installed with on this droplet already, you know that. Um, I can go ahead and create some file like secret.txt. Now, I don't want to like configure the whole server, um, but yeah, I can have something like this, right? So we have an Nginx server running. So you see service status Nginx. You're gonna see, oops, service Nginx status. You're gonna see that it's active, it's running, it's loaded, right? We have a secret.txt file as well available with us. Let's just go ahead and create a snapshot out of this droplet. So I'm going to go ahead and write power off here, which is going to shut down my droplet. It's a good thing to do before you are creating snapshots so that the server is actually able to write anything which is buffered in the RAM to the hard disk so that there's no data loss or data corruption, right? And once you do that, you're going to go ahead and see that this icon turns actually grayish and you have the off here. Now what I'm going to do is go to snapshots and I'm going to click on create, take the snapshot that you can give it a name, my first snapshot and take the snapshot. Now, mind you, this might take some time if the size of your droplet is very large, right? For example, if you're running anywhere closer than four, five, six GBs, then it's going to take some time about, I guess, four, five minutes. So, yeah. So the idea is that uh, once you have the snapshot with you, you can replicate this anywhere in the world. By world, I mean anywhere in the world with the DigitalOcean data centers, right? And you can delete the original instance, it does not matter. You're gonna be able to save the state of that and restore it anytime when you create the instance with the snapshot. So I'm just gonna show you the final result here of the snapshot. You cannot unfortunately download the snapshot file. I would have loved to download it as well and, you know, just keep it as a backup or something. But yeah, probably this is some proprietary thing or whatever. But yeah, they do not allow you to download your snapshots yet. So you see we are close to uh, finishing and you can see that the size of the snapshot is 1.21 GB. Now you might ask me that why the size is too large when we did not really do anything. Well, for starters, 
this is actually a copy of the whole system not your not just your changes or not just your your own work so it includes the ubuntu operating system it includes the nginx it includes that text file everything so that accumulates to about a gb or something right rest um is your own data so um after this size this depends on more or less your own data so once we have this snapshot we can go ahead and create droplets from it but i'm going to show you how we do that in the next video so that's all for this one and i'm going to see you pretty soon in the next one hey everyone welcome back my name is mehul and in this one we're going to be actually creating a droplet back from our first snapshot so it's pretty simple you just have to go ahead and create a droplet just like you used to but instead of instead of choosing ubuntu as your base image as your distribution what you're going to do is go to snapshots and choose your snapshot here right so you see we named our snapshot as my first snapshot and you see that DigitalOcean has actually determined the operating system running on this droplet on, on this um, image that is ubuntu so there's that that's it now once you do that you're going to be able to see you're going to be able to customize this thing one short tip that is i created the snapshot on a five dollar instance right so i can go ahead and select any size but if i had created the snapshot on an 80 dollar instance then mind you you cannot create you cannot create droplets um which have the configuration less than 16 gb and 6 cpus or which have the configuration less than the hard disk size right not the cpu and ram i don't think so but the hard disk is definitely there the reason for that is the data is not really stored um in a sequential manner right so you always have to choose a droplet in that case digital ocean would disable it itself but just so you know you cannot select a droplet of size forty dollars per month if you have a snapshot of size eighty dollars per month right because uh, you're trying to fit data which is sparsed over 320 gb of ssd over 160 gb of ssd right so that's that so yeah for now i'm just gonna go ahead and choose five dollars per month and uh, you can see that i'm locked down in san francisco because this is where that snapshot is available but you can definitely move snapshot around the regions as well that's not a problem you can do that so if you want you can customize its vpc network i'm just gonna keep it no vpc at the moment ssh keys yep we want the same ssh key and yep this would be just a single droplet my first recovery would be the name and i'm just going to give it into mehul mohan and create droplet so once we do that you're gonna see that we have my first recovery booting up we can simultaneously also start out vpc so that we can actually ssh into this thing and see if it's if it's same or not right so meanwhile it's starting let me just go ahead and see if i can ssh into it that's the right ipv4 address so let's see so meanwhile what i want is for the public ip address let's just set up ssh root at the rate public ip address and i want the key to be this one you see we are into out vpc and you can see that we still have our secret.txt file with us and we still have nginx running nicely right now if i go ahead and boot into my first recovery which is working now you're gonna see that i did not install anything this is my first time ssh into this thing but the nginx is working out of the box magic if you go ahead on this site directly you're going to see that nginx actually serves you the home page it's great right you can also see that if you ls into this we have this file magically from the out vpc right we never created this file on my first recovery but it's still there so you see that basically out vpc actually uh not out vpc but snapshot actually just copies each and everything um as it is right so yeah i mean that's how droplets work that's how snapshots work in droplets and that's how you can restore a complete droplet without actually 
keeping it running for the whole month or for the whole time all along, right? Super efficient, super cost saving. If you have periodic works with cloud and uh, you know, you don't want to run, keep running the cloud computer always. So that's all for this video. And I'm going to see you in the next one really quick. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, we're going to be starting off with something known as DigitalOcean Spaces, which is like, um, one of my favorite things out of all DigitalOcean features. So I pretty much uh, think that everyone who has worked with cloud even a little has heard about what AWS S3 is, right? Um, S3 is like the most popular solution out there to store files online, right? If you are, if you are running it as a company, of course. So S3 stands for simple storage service, I guess. And what they do is they, uh, they are actually a block storage service. Now there's a different difference between volume and block storage, but we're gonna get into that later on. So what DigitalOcean did is that they created their own service, but instead of reinventing the whole thing, what they did is that they used their infrastructure, their architecture all along, but they used the S3 API, the programming API used to interact with S3 from the S3 um, itself, right? So I think that's a, that's a good move because that allows a lot of people who are working on AWS to very swiftly shift to DigitalOcean, especially if they're just using it for S3. And given that AWS charges a hell lot for data transfer. So yeah. Let's just go ahead and take a look at what S3 is and how you work with it all along in this little section. Hey everyone, welcome back. And in this video, let's just go ahead and take a look at two most popular solutions on how storage works. That is block storage and object storage. Now, if you go ahead inside volumes here, you're gonna see that you actually have an option to create a block storage. Now, you know, when you click on this add, st add volume, you can even see that it says that volumes are highly available units of block storage, right? So what, what the hell does this word block actually means? Well, block storage is one kind of storage, number one. Number two is there's another kind of storage called as object storage. Now, the difference between these two storages is, first thing, block storage is more like your regular hard disk or your regular SSD, right? Which you're familiar with, with your computers. So you see that you log in into your systems, you have all those files and folders, you know, folders inside folders and folders inside folders and so on. You have a hierarchy of system, you know, files are created in a certain order, in a certain manner. There's a certain hierarchy. You go to the C drive, then you go to program files, all that good stuff, right? So that is a file system, file system in place, right? And that works over the top of this block storage. So this concept of having a file system in place, you know, nicely organizing files. I'm not going to get into technicalities of how it works, how it differs on a technical level, but just to give an overview of idea, your file system, your operating system, the laptop you are on, the mobile phone you are on, the server when you SSH into it is using block storage. Block storage is very good for you know, having humans interact with hard disk for storage stuff because you have that all nicely laid convention of, um, you know, hierarchies and files and folders. There's another type of storage which was developed out of needs for having a scalable solution for storages and that is known as object storage. Now, nobody really offers object storage like that. They offer it as a service, right? So Spaces is DigitalOcean's service as an object, as an object storage, right? You can even see it right here. It's an object storage. So an object storage, um, leaving the technical things apart, what it does is that it, it allows you to store the whole chunk of file, your whole file, as it is on the hard disk, on the metal, without a file system. Now, of course, when you do that, it's, it's very difficult to extract it out um, um, using an operating system or anything because your operating system does not know how to work with that, that particular piece of metal, right? How to extract that information? Where does it start? Where does it end? And all that good stuff. There are ways to, you know, to fix that, but 
it leads to a performance hit or whatever and all that causes but the first thing is that object storage is not even built for having to attach to an operating system right so what what the spaces does and what s3 does as well whereas all the other storages does as well is that when you create an object on object storage in our case on the G digital ocean spaces it's going to actually give you a url to access that and for the most part you need only that thing because for the most part when you're using spaces or s3 or any other solution which uses object storage what you want is you want probably a large file or maybe a lot of small files as well to be publicly accessible or privately accessible right so maybe you want to have a streaming video site like youtube or something maybe you want to i don't know allow people to upload stuff right so you don't want them to upload that stuff directly to your servers because number one you can exhaust your server space there and number two is that it's just not efficient for your server to be running with the user data because what happens if if your instance is destroyed or um, I don't know if you delete it by accident or whatever so you lose all that data with block storage that is avoided because that is managed by the cloud provider right with all the resilience and backups built in so yeah this is the basic idea between object storage and block storage spaces digital ocean spaces is the digital ocean version of block storage which um, it borrows from the s3 um, idea right so yeah there's that so that's all for this video and I'm going to see you very soon in the next one. All right, guys, let's just go ahead and create our first space. So I'm going to go ahead and create the space just like by saying that. And you can see that you can go ahead and select a region in which you want to create a space. And right now, as you can see, it's pretty much limited to just three. Um, probably they are running under space or whatever. But yeah you can go ahead and create in singapore amsterdam or san francisco for now it might be different when you see it yourself but yeah that's it for me so yep that's the first step the second step is actually configuring a cdn right so a cdn um well i can go all day into that but for the most part what it does is that it allows your users your end users to fetch the resources faster because they do not have to complete a whole round trip around the planet to reach to your main server to get that particular content right in this case it would be the data center where you're going to be storing your data so for example if you choose singapore and someone from let's say america is trying to access a file stored on this space then his his um, connection has to travel all around the world to reach singapore and then send it back but if you enable CDN, there might be a cached um, object of that thing available in New York, right? So they, they skip that whole traveling thing. It saves a bunch of milliseconds, but yeah, it, it's good. So we're going to enable that later on, but for now, I'm just going to proceed. The next thing is allowing file listing. Now, for the most part, what you want is, well, it, for, not for the most part, it really depends on case to case. Um, you can enable file listing or you can restrict file listing as well. So what enable file listing does is that it, it makes the objects on your space available as a list through a URL, right? So DigitalOcean can give you a space URL and, uh, you know, you can just go ahead and visit that URL and you'll be able to just browse your whole object storage just like you would do with a regular file system just like ftp would work as a matter of fact so yeah i'm gonna enable it for now and finally you need to choose a unique name right so it should be a globally unique name not just under your account so i'm gonna say code dam is the best right hopefully nobody has taken that and yep and you can see that it gives me your spaces origin url and i'm just gonna go ahead with my personal project create a space digital ocean space is pretty cheap cost five dollars a month for 250 gb storage and one terabyte of data transfer if you exceed the space no problem that's that's that has a different pricing but yeah that's what you get out of the box for five dollars a month 250 gb of storage per month and uh, not per month but yeah 250 gb of storage overall 
and one terabyte of free data transfer per month. So when I go ahead and visit this, you're going to see that I get a nice little XML thing and you see that we do not have anything really here. So this is your spaces interface and this is how you can upload files. This is one way of uploading file. There's another way using the APIs, which we can get to later on. But one of the ways, if you have a bunch of files to upload right away, is using this particular interface on DigitalOcean. So we're going to upload a file really quick and see how this looks like in the next video. So let's just go ahead and watch that video really quick. So what is going on everybody? My name is Mehul and welcome back. And in this video, we're going to be uploading our first file on spaces. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on the upload files button like a good boy. And let's just go ahead and select any image. Like for example, I have my this image as uh, you know, I'm so smart and I'm just going to keep it public for now. Now you can set the file to be private or public. Now, why would you do private in, in what case and how would you access that? Well, that is something which I want to discuss in the next video. But in this video, I'm just going to keep it public and upload it. So once you click on upload, you're going to see that it just uploads it just like any nice site would do and gives you the size and last modified and everything. And we have the name as well. When you hover over the file, it's going to give you a URL and a preview as well. So you can go ahead and click on this URL and you're going to see my smart handsome face right so there i am sitting um chilling whatever and uh, i think it's way too much zoom yep so there i am and what you can do is you can take a look in the url it's exactly the same name as your file with the same extension right so nothing funny going around here nothing renaming or whatever digital ocean is just taking whatever you have given to it and just throwing it directly in the object storage now this file right here is now available on internet you can share this url to anybody in the world and they can go ahead and you know just see this and the good fact is this file the file you uploaded can have any reasonable size i mean like tens and hundreds of gbs even right so it's, it's pretty great you can even upload whole folders as well you know one great place to store all your book collection or maybe your games collection as well so there's that so yeah that's how you're gonna upload file that's how you're gonna get url for that and for the most part you can also delete this file if you don't want it any longer so you can just go ahead and delete it and that's it you're gonna see that we have a bunch of things here as well you can go ahead and rename it because just like i said it starts with the same name which you given it so I'm going to rename it to Mehul and uh, once I do that, this URL would no longer be working. Now, yeah, I just needed to fresh, refresh in the cache. And once you go ahead and hit mehul.jpg.jpg now, you're going to see you get my nice, awesome face again. So, so as to speak, if I go ahead on the root URL now, you're going to see that I have this thing with me right now. Let's just discuss a little bit about this, this XML file in the next video really quick. All right, so we see this nice little XML file with us and right off the bat, you can see that the namespace, the XML namespace it's following is from S3. So just like I said, DigitalOcean uses its own infrastructure, but it uses the S3 API in order to coordinate, in order to manage that object storage which is a tried tested and battle tested um api right so as to say a battle tested implementation s3 is like the de facto standard for working with block storages at least in the cloud space so yeah once you visit a page like this where you have your file listing enabled so you remember that right here inside the settings when we created the space we had that checkbox on um you know this file listing available so yep this was this thing right so what it did is that it allowed you to see this xml file right here and when you see in the contents you're gonna see that we have um the file name the last modified thing some sort of e-tag information and the size of the file this is in bytes storage class is standard this is again coming from the S3 thing. S3 has a lot of storage classes available, 
DigitalOcean just ships with a single storage class so as to avoid confusion. And yeah, it's always going to be standard here unless of course DigitalOcean updates their um, Spaces API as well. So yeah, that's that's basically for the contents part. You upload more files, you're gonna see a lot of more things as well here. So if I go ahead and create, probably create a folder or something, you're gonna see folder one. And uh, if I go ahead and refresh this, it's just going to take a little bit of time to update stuff, but it would eventually um, show you that folder as well, that nested folder, right? So if I go ahead and upload my same photo again, make sure this is public. I'm gonna go ahead and see that right here, I get that folder now, right? So I get this file right here, I get the size right here, and it's all, all good and fun. So you see we have three keys now, it's folder itself, so it has size zero, so there's that. Then we have the actual file with us. So yeah, that's how the XML file interpretation works. For the most part, you would want to disable it because you do not really want a lot of people to see what is your whole bucket storing. So you want to disable it, right? And how you disable it is just by going to your spaces settings, just like I showed you, and clicking on um, edit restrict file access. Hit save and you should be good. Now if you go ahead and refresh this, you're gonna get a nice little access denied message. So that's it. Now nobody can list the files, although they can still access the file um, just as they would earlier. So yeah, that's me right there, chilling. So, okay, so that's all for this video. In the next one, we're gonna be seeing how the private files work in spaces and how you can make it work as well. So I'll see you then pretty quickly in the next one. So what is going on everybody? Welcome back. And in this video, we're gonna be seeing how private files work in DigitalOcean and uh, how you can actually make the best use of them. So what happens is a lot of times you don't really want all the files to be public. Sometimes you, for example, sometimes you have some sort of video content just like this, which I'm shooting right now, um, to be only available to members, right? And you don't want them to share links or maybe, you know, just share them to social media sites because once your link is shared, you can basically no longer prevent anyone from seeing it, right? So what you can do instead is you can upload that file as a private file, which would then um, make it not available on its own URL. Well, then what's the benefit? Well, the thing with private files, however, is that you can access them with a special thing known as a signature. And what the signature would do is that it will provide you access to that particular file for a very small period, whatever you decide, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, a day, a week, even more, like, right? So yeah, you can provide as much access as you want, as little access as you want as well. The thing is, the file link, when it expires, your user or whatever um, was using that file can no longer actually um, you view that file. So let's just go ahead and take a look at that. A lot of talking is going on. So let me just go ahead and upload me again because I'm so fabulous. And I'm going to make this private this time. So right, I'm going to go ahead and upload this. Once it uploads, you're going to see we have the same file but this time, if I go ahead and copy this name right here, um, or let's just go ahead and see if I have that in URL cache itself. Seven, yep. You see, when I try to do that, I get access denied. Instead of the file, instead of me showing the file, I get an access denied. So now, how do we actually view this file, which is with us, right? So you see that if I go ahead and hover over this, I still get the preview with me. And if I take a look, you see, if I copy the URL, it's still that incomplete URL which shows me access denied. So how is DigitalOcean actually getting this preview for me when I cannot access this uh, myself? So for that, what we can do is just hover over it and I can right click and copy or maybe open image in new tab. Now, if I open it, you're gonna see I get my nice little thing. But what, what has happened, what has changed? 
you see the difference between these two URLs is number one, this is actually looking a little bit different than this one. Well, it, for the most part, it does not really matter. But in this case, it matters because the way um, DigitalOcean generated this URL. But yeah, it's more or less the same thing. Don't worry about this code dam is the best part being in the subdomain or being in the path, right? It would work just fine. So just so you know, let me just go ahead and show you that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this part right here. And I'm going to paste this right here as the path. And there you go. You can see it still works just fine, right? So anyway, this is our signed URL with us. And let me just go ahead and enlarge in that for you so that all of you guys can see that. So you see, this is our signed URL. So we are familiar with this much, right? This was our previous name. What enables us to view that actual thing, view that actual image is this part right here. So this is an actual signature, right? It is a file signature used by S3 and spaces. And you can clearly see it's an X Amazon algorithm. So um, yeah, it's basically using AWS S3, some sort of S3 algorithms to generate all this stuff. The idea is you can go ahead and generate these URLs programmatically and uh, set the duration when it expires. In this case, you can see it says us Amazon expires in 3600. And uh, yeah, that is basically how much this is in seconds. I don't know, just divided by 60 or something, right? So you'll get 60 minutes as the answer. So you, this, this URL is going to expire in an hour. So yeah, that's how it works. Now, to share this resource right here, you most most likely would be using some sort of, um, you know, some sort of API or generating this, this signed URL in some sort of programmatic way. And yeah, for the most part, that is its purpose. So if you go ahead and take a look at this URL, it's looking fine. Um, okay, it looks like we missed something while copying that. So anyway, this is the part. But if I go ahead and change anything out of this URL, for example, the credential key, or maybe, for example, if I try to tamper with the, um, let's see, 36000 expiry key, you see that the signature stops matching, right? And I cannot really access the resource. So yeah, that's how you're gonna access signed URLs. We're gonna see more how now you can generate signed URLs in the other section in the DigitalOcean APIs. But yeah, that's it for the most part. That's all for this video. And I'm going to see you pretty soon in the next one. Thank you so much, guys, for following along the whole series. It's been a great journey for me and hopefully for you to um, exploring your first cloud, exploring a lot of new features, a lot of things DigitalOcean has to offer, creating and setting up your own first servers. So it's pretty exciting stuff. So this was the basic um, series for DigitalOcean. Keep an eye on the courses Code Dam has to offer because there would be some intermediate and advanced courses coming up on cloud computing as well. So that's all for this course. And if you liked it, try out the next courses in our learning path. And I'll see you very soon on other courses on codedam.com.